Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, it's mid-June here in Calgary. We have lots of rain outside and no water anywhere in the city, but as always, I'm Dan and Matt's here with me, and we're going to talk about the Flames. Matt, thankfully, there's no ice on the Saddle Dome ice. The Flames opted out of going to the Stanley Cup Finals to do their part in conserving the water. Yes, well, uh, yeah, it's been a bit of a mess in the city of Calgary, but, you know, I was actually thinking about that. I was thinking, like, you know, if the Flames were in the Finals, would they be allowed to play? Would they be saying we can't, you know, fill the rink? I know. Uh, and you're starting to hear all that kind of complaining about the Stamps games and, you know, the Stampede coming up and all that kind of nonsense. Well, a little bit and, different with the Stamps games. They play on grass, not on frozen ice. But, yeah. True. Um, that, that's my... I, I, I thought that would be kind of an interesting... I thought it was an interesting kind of thought experiment this morning. But we're not here to talk about the uh, the ice. We're here to talk about the draft and and by the way i do have to mention that uh for how much i suck during uh, the regular season with our weekly predictions this year's playoffs have actually done fairly well i've actually picked 14 out of the 15 assuming florida finishes off the oilers uh the oilers uh, making the finals was the only one i got wrong so you know at least with that i got it down pat <laughs> Well, before we jump into the draft, let's talk about that quickly. As we record this now, uh, Florida's up three to one, or sorry, three nothing against Edmonton. They played the first game in Edmonton um, earlier in the week and won there. What do you think the chance of a sweep for Florida is? I think that Florida wants, with Kachuk and Bennett there and their love of the Oilers. I think that they would be very happy to rub it in all of the Oilers fans' face to hoist it in front of them. So I would assume that Florida will come out gunning to end it tonight. Do you think they'll be able to? Yep. I think the Oilers, I think the Oilers are going to take one. Yeah, I think, I don't know. I think the Oilers have to win one game of this series. They're not yeah. that bad. But Matt, um, a lot of... Fl- they're a the lot of, Oilers, of course they're, they're that the bad. Finals. Yeah, well, they shouldn't have been there. <laughs> That's true. Um, a lot of a lot of fans in the city saying we only support the Oilers, their Kansas team. Boo. I've said I will throw very, tomatoes at anybody. <laughs> there's very few scenarios in which I could see myself. Um, I could see myself ever cheering for the Oilers. Have you, I know the Panthers are your second favorite team, so that's who you're cheering for. But yeah, like I, I the Oilers are my thirty second favorite team. So literally anybody else, I would be happier that they would win. So. Uh, yeah, I'm good with whomever kicks the crap out of the Oilers. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, there's no way that I could. Uh, there's no way that I could be cheering for the Oilers. No, but let's. I, get to I, the- I don't care about the Cup not being back in Canada. Uh, you know, it, it just like in 2011 when Vancouver played Boston, I was cheering for the Bruins because Vancouver didn't need a Cup then, and you know the uh, the Oilers are a s- equally charming team and i don't like anybody on the organization so um yeah go panthers <laughs> yeah i th- i would like it to come to canada just not with the oilers yeah the jets the leafs the senators the canadians i'm fine even vancouver as they are now i would not mind if they did um uh, the 2011 version no cuz guys like kessler and burrows yeah, no. <laughs> I don't hate Vancouver as much as a lot of Flames fans do. Yeah. Well, now that they got rid of that kind of type of player, I, I do, they're they're kind of like the vanilla team like they were in the 90s to me. Makes sense. Um I am going to yeah, I I'm I'm going to be cheering hard tonight for the Panthers. The Panthers need to end this one, and I really—I mean, let's be honest. There's no way the Oilers get four wins before they get one loss, right? They're done. True. Yeah, and that's that's what it comes down to. And I would like to see a sweep because the last time it happened was 1998, um, when the Detroit Red Wings beat the Washington Capitals, and it's been a fairly long time since we've had an actual sweep in the finals. Yeah, and I I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens, but we know the Oilers aren't going to win. Yeah. Which is good. So, Matt, let's look at the draft here for the Flames. We will do a quick draft preview today. 
Um, then at the end of the show, we'll talk a little bit more about what else we're going to do for the draft, but let's take a look at the Calgary Flames first round. The Calgary Flames have a lot of picks in this draft. Um, if we go through it, they have two picks in the first. They obviously have the ninth pick, which was theirs. They have the 28th pick, which was Vancouver's that they got in the Lindholm deal. In the second round, they have theirs and Dallas's. In the third round, they have theirs and um, the Golden Knights. In the fourth, they have theirs and New Jersey's. They have no fifth round pick, their own sixth and their own seventh. So uh, they got, they're they going to be bringing in, I mean, whether they make those picks or use them as currency, there's a lot of opportunity at this draft. Well, and they frankly need it. Um, with the prospect pool looking extremely thin as we're going into a rebuild, we need to start getting some youth into the organization that can actually look ahead to taking spots in the organization in two or three seasons from now. For sure. Um, should we jump right in? Yes, definitely. So Matt is our scout and he's been uh, looking at, he's, he's our, he's our Todd button. He's been looking at some of the players available and trying to figure out who we think the flames might take. I've done a little bit of this as well. Um, we have some possible players to look at here at nine and 28. We're not going to go past the first round. It's a lot harder to project past that first round, but we'll take a look at these picks. So with the nine, yeah, um, yeah, th I just want to lead off with one thing. This year's draft is a little bit different um, than a lot of years' draft, where you know there's a lot of different like tiers in terms of like one through three is good, and then you got like four through six. Basically, number one, Macklin Celebrini, who's going to the Sharks, is better than everybody else. But uh, like the 2016 draft where the Flames got Kachuk, there's a lot of really good players that are basically equivalent from two right through till about 11. Uh, so the Flames, even if they don't get the guy that I think all Flames fans want, like there are plenty of good players available. You're going to get a really good player at nine. Yeah, like the the caliber of defensemen that are available, like the top fifteen is very D heavy. Um, you're going to get a good one regardless of who you select. Um, they're all very good offensive defensemen in the same mold as like Adam Fox, Kale McCarr, and Quinn Hughes, that kind of guy, and they're all very good. So like this is a good year if. Uh, a certain uh, relative of a uh, We'll start with him when we, when we jump into this. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think the thing to know, too, is there is no clear-cut order once you're out of maybe the top three. Like, you know, the guy the Flames have at nine might be completely different than who somebody else has at nine. And I think, you know, there's not the best player available in a lot of cases. I think, really, this is going to be a draft where uh, teams who aren't in that top three are going to be looking for positional need. Yeah, and realistically, like uh, the the top forward and defenseman besides uh, Celebrini are Demidov and Levshunov, uh, Artem Levshunov and uh, um, Ivan Demidov, and like realistically, those guys probably go in the top four or top three. But then again, because of the type of defensemen that are available, one of those guys could fall to five, six, seven, eight. So let's let's start with the elephant in the room. Let's start with the uh, I guess the second generation of Ginla, TJ Ginla, the guy that everyone wants. Jerome McGinla's oldest son is in the draft this year. He's currently 17. Um, he's had a good year, really good year. Left shooter, six foot, 185 pounds. He played his full season for the Kelowna Rockets in 64 games. He had 84 total points. And then the U18 tournament, he had uh, 12 points in seven games. Really good kid. I think every Flames fan wants that next to Ginla. Well, Do you think that if... Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the problem that the the team has... If Aginla is not off the board by the time the ninth pick comes well, That's what I was going to ask. Do you kind of have to take him? Yeah, you kind of do. Uh, because every time the other guy, whomever you pick, it, he comes up, he's going to get, you know, lambasted in the media to an extent by, oh, well, we took you instead of Aginla. And, you know, and unless that guy becomes a star player in his own right, like, it, it, it's going to add a ton of pressure to 
if you take anybody else. And but I think you're also going to have a ton of pressure on Tej as he's developing. Of he's not where Dad was. He's not where Dad was. He's not where Dad was. Well, and that that's kind of the catch twenty two. But I think that because Dad's part of the organization, that it's a lot less because of the fact that well, you know, and you you see that with a couple other teams too, where like they've drafted. Uh, sons of former NHLers, and it's been fine. Um, and well, but former NHLers and former like stars in the organization, like I, I personally think Matthew Kachuk would not have developed the way he was if he went to St. Louis. Yeah, I could see that, and it, it's one of those things that it, it, it definitely is a catch twenty two. Realistically, you know, Calgary is both the best and the worst place for him to get drafted to because organizationally, there is no winger in the organization that's ahead of him. So, like, he would be the top prospect, period, coming up. So there's nobody in front of him. And, um, but then you also have the added pressure of, well, because your dad is literally the face of the franchise, <laughs> that... You know, yeah. <laughs> I think with Tej, I think he would be fast tracked through a lot of opportunities that maybe he shouldn't be. I think, you know, I think that whoever they they sign needs to be developed correctly and not oh, I jump agree. into the NHL. And you know, I'm worried that Tej might say make that step ahead of someone else and not get HL development time or something like that. And I. Like I, yeah. I know what you're saying. I personally think the best thing to do is to stay away from Tej, and I think the only way you can do it is to have him drafted already. Yeah, and realistically, if he's available at nine, I do not see any way that the Flames can pick anybody else. And the one unless good... they trade down to avoid him, just keep trading down till he's gone. Yeah, well, and it's one of those things where it Imagine would be different they, if they, he was they not... trade their way all the way down to twenty seven. Like crap, he's still there. <laughs> And now we got Fine, a bunch of seventh we'll round picks you. we don't need. Fine, we'll take you. <laughs> That's right. Now we got a bunch of seventh round picks we don't need. Yes, uh, but no. And realistically, if you take the name Aginla off of the player, he's a great player. Oh yeah, he's exactly like when the Flames drafted Matthew Kachuk. That was why I was so high on Matthew Kachuk was because he was that right attitude and demeanor of player, and he elevated the game when the games mattered and you know give me that player anytime regardless of his name you know a hundred times out of a hundred you know like i if i put this way if i was the gm of chicago or anaheim i'd be considering it because of how good he is when the games actually matter just like his old man and you know just like Matthew Kachuk was when he got drafted by the Flames and you know and we're seeing that now in the playoffs with the Panthers and over the last two seasons and you know it, it's one of those that like especially as this team's kind of in a blank slate you kind of have to figure out an identity of building that cup team mm -hmm. and because we are literally at the zero point and getting parts that fit that general mold is I, what I think that the team should prioritize. Yeah, I'm, I don't know. I know everyone's kind of excited and that this is a foregone conclusion. I, I personally, I, I'm not saying the T should never be a flame. I just don't know they should draft him to me, especially with the American League team here in town. I think there's going to be more added pressure. If you could bring him in as an 18 year old, let him play junior for a year or two, send him off to Stockton where he's out of sight, out of mind. I think there'd be a lot different development curve. But if he's playing AHL hockey with dad's number above him the whole time, I think that's going to be a tough thing to develop and not have some of those comparisons every night. And maybe the best thing to do is have him go to Montreal, have him go to Utah, have him go somewhere else, and bring him in when he's a, when he's a free agent. Well, and the thing is that, uh, you know, like if he's the type of player that elevates, you know, the added pressure might actually be, well, hey, dad could do this. I can do better. And it might, but we don't you know. know that, and right? like we saw that with Kachuk, like Matthew is a better player than his old man was, and his old man was one of the star players of his generation. For and sure. But again, I think it worked because they weren't in the same market. True. If you were every day getting, and it also worked because his, his old man wasn't a star. If he was in 
you know, if he was in that market and he was getting compared every day to his old man, who was one of the best to ever play in that organization, it'd be very different. It's almost like Shane Doan's kid, right? I mean, Shane Doan was the best to do it for that organization. He's had a couple of games. I've already heard some comparisons and a little bit of NHL time of this kid's not Shane. Well, no, he's not. He's different, right? Yeah. So I think, you know, I think it's different with Kachuk because, again, his dad wasn't that top level guy. I mean, well, you know, yeah, he kind of was like he, he was getting paid 9 million a year. Like he, he was, was, but he was I, a top I, flight player when he was with both Phoenix and St. Louis. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But again, I think if I, so I think if Matthew Kachuk was in St. Louis, it would have been a very different story, right? Yeah. Just like if TJ Gimlet goes to Montreal, I think he can develop there. He can be compared to dad, but dad's numbers not hanging above his head every night. Bobby Hall did not play for Chicago when he, you know, or Bobby Hall played for Chicago. Brett did not when he started, right? I think that helped Brett develop. Like, I think if we look at a lot of the kids of stars, they've developed best when they're not in dad's backyard. True. It, it just, I think the storyline and the fact that the Flames are kind of starting from a zero point, um, you know, like that would definitely help to kick off some enthusiasm for the rebuild. Um, where, you know, like, as much as, like, there are a bunch of really high-end players, like, you're not going to see the same sort of excitement for, like, a Consta Hellenius if he were to be drafted. or. But also, you know. I, I worry that it could give us the wrong enthusiasm. Our fans going to be saying, we need him on the NHL roster, we need him on the NHL roster, we need him on the NHL roster, and they pull a Sam Bennett and fast-track him. Well, and... And to be fair, like, a Ginla didn't become a Ginla until, like, his sixth, seventh season in the NHL. Like, he was basically, like, a 20, 25, 30 goal guy until, like, 0 one Sure, but again, he there was no out. expectation or pressure, right? No. And, like, realistically, like, Tij, if the Flames drafted him, would be kind of expected to maybe be a second-line player with maybe first-line upside if he hits all the marks, but... You know, it, it's just one of those where, um, like, frankly, the Flames, regardless of who they pick, like, they need guys who can score. And it just coincidentally happens that Aginla has, like, one of the best shots. I wonder why. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he might have picked up some tips from his old man. But, you know, it, it, it's just one of those things where, like, if you remove the name off, the the back of the jersey like he would still be the player yeah. i would be most for sure wanting. If, if his name was Tej smith i'd pick him up in a heartbeat it's the or even if his name was Tej, i don't know pick a Tej smith ryan smith's kid from edmonton or some other nhl player who wasn't a you know a flames legend right Tej fedorov or somebody like that i'd still be willing to go for him it's the calgary star connection that i'm worried about yeah which makes sense, and yeah. it, it's one of those that, like, it, it's hard. Like, if he's on the board, like, I, I do not see how... Because, like, you're going to add all Teach that pressure. Sackick, right? If he was Joe Sackick's kid, I'd still take him. Yeah, it, it's just hard if you take anybody else. Like, all the pressure that would have been on Tej will now be on the guy that... Well, you, you're, you know, the flame slot... could have had Tej, yeah. You know, so it's really a damned if you do, damned if you don't. It is. And as a, I guess, as a pundit, I'm I'm pretty sure that Tej will go before the Flames get to the podium, and I think that might actually be the best for them. Yeah, and I I wouldn't be shocked either if he went, like, 6th or 7th um, either, but if he's available at 9, I think that there's They've got to take him, yeah. Yeah, there's only one name you can realistically... Yeah. Cause, Cause, after all, like it's also about, you know, uh, it's entertainment a as a sport, and I think that basically all the fan bases around the league would prefer to see Aginla in Calgary because, hey, that's a cool storyline more so than, you know, oh well, you know, it's like Cole Sillinger uh, being with Columbus. It's like, K, okay, cool. Your old man was in the NHL, or and yeah, or, or Domi not being in in Toronto <laughs> until now. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I get what you're saying, and I mean, even then, we're not going to see Tej on the NHL roster next year. So, oh no, it'll probably be two or three years before he would make the NHL. Sort of like Coronado, where it took a while. Well, but Coronado, I would say, hasn't even made the NHL yet. But no. Yeah. Well, it, that's the first cup of coffee. Turn anyway. pro. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, let's move on to somebody else. We've talked about Tiege. If he's there, they'll probably have to take him for better or for worse. We'll talk about that on the 28th and see what happens when we get there. The next guy that you'd profile is Ivan Demidov. He's a right winger and center from Russia. He's 18 years old, shoots left. Uh, this past year, he played for a couple different teams. He had a, some KHL time, some VHL time, and mostly played in the MHL over in Russia. 60 points in 30 games. This guy is uh, a he's a dangler. He's a very offensive forward. A lot of people said he's a tactician. What do you like about Demidov? Uh, stylistically, he is basically Artemi Panarin or Kirill Kaprizov. He is a dynamic, offensively gifted forward. Um, he's fast. He's slippery. He's dangerous. I would not be shocked if he is going to be uh, the next winger alongside Bedard, but the whole Russian factor could make him slip a number of spots. I've seen him ranked by most people at number two or three, as low as six. I don't think he's going to fall that far to the flames. No. We'll see. I mean, like you said, the Russian factor, maybe. Would you be concerned about taking him as a Russian? No, not at all. And gambling uh, that with the amount of Russians that the Flames now have, you know, it, it kind of like the Flames kind of become like the new Washington Capitals, where like all the Russians seem to be here, and it seems to be a good little culture of Russian players now in the Flames organization. So it would be different if we we're like flashback to like three years ago, where we hadn't had anybody for. A number of years but we're kind of now like one of the preferred destinations it seems so i have no problem with that i think too that you know two three years from now when any of these players are ready to be potentially on the nhl roster there's going to be spots open and i think no matter what you know what country you come from if there's a potential nhl spot you're going to be excited to go there you're not going to stay in russia if you could become a second line nhl winger it's when you're bringing these guys over and you know the best they could do is third line or fourth line so i think just the fact the flames will have um you know top spots available in a couple of years that's going to be attractive to anybody mm-hmm the next guy on your list here, and um, another guy from sounds like Russian, but Belarusian, Belarusian, which means he's uh, the same as um, number seventeen, who's also Belarusian right now um, for the Flames. Another eighteen-year-old from Belarus. He is right, right shot defenseman, six foot two, two hundred nine pounds. This is Artyom Lejunov. I probably said that wrong, Lejunov. He's right now yeah. playing in Michigan State, um, so he's over in North America. He had 35 goals in 38 games with Michigan State. Matt, what do you like about this kid? Uh, he is the first in a bunch of players from this draft where that's the high-end offensive defensive guy. Um, he's six foot two, like he's already NHL size, but he has a similar game to guys like Hughes McCarr. Fox and, and plays that slippery offensively skilled game and he can attack at will and he does a very good job of it and he's good defensively again the Russian factor might slip him past, I mean he's like, he's Belarusian like 17 like Sharon Govich so I you know I could see maybe that being a factor to bring him over yeah but uh and yeah, he's already I don't in see... the, he's already in the states too which I think is very different yeah, and I don't see him falling past five, but he he was kind of like the first of the group of guys mm -hmm. that we're going to profile because they're all basically the same guy. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the Russian factors as much when they're already over here. Like, I can't think of many Russians that come play NCAA and then say, screw the NHL and leave. It's guys that are already in the KHL and stuff like that. So the fact that he played... Um, you know, in the USHL and now in Michigan State, if uh, NCAA, I think he's here. Like, if you know, you'll you'll probably easily get him over if you want him. Um, like you said, he's as low as three on some people's rankings, as high as ten or even eleven on other ones. So could fall the Flames. I think they the Flames really need to bring that defensive skill level up. I mean, they've got three NHL defensemen next year. They've got some extra spots after that, but they really don't have a prospect defenseman outside of Poirier who's interesting. I could totally see if he's available, jump on him to start building up that blue line uh, depth. 
Yeah, and I frankly, think, just on an overall, like if the Flames do not get a Ginla, uh, say that he was drafted ahead of the Flames pick, I fully expect them to go D-man with their first pick. I do too. Yeah, I think, like we said, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. You got to take a Ginla if he's on the board, um, Iggy Jr. But I think if not, this is the year to take a defenseman early. You know, it's yeah. not sexy. It's not always what the fans Well, and want, especially but- this happens to be, yeah, well, this year's draft lends heavy on D-men regardless. Um, and my own philosophy is if there's ever a year where a specific position is, like, overloaded, pick as many of those guys as possible just because you tend to get more diamonds in the rough that, you know, get overshadowed. Uh, yeah. And like that's how the Flames got TJ Brody in 2008 as a fourth round pick when he probably would have went in the second round if there wasn't already like 20 really good defensemen ahead of him. And also from a pure aspect, I guess, aspect management perspective, you can often get more for a young defenseman if you do have to move them. Right. And the Flames were able to get a sure. little bit more for Adam Fox, partly because he was good, but partly he's a defenseman. Everyone's looking for those young demons. There's less of them out there. Yeah. The next one. Yeah, on and that the... was the benefit oh, of the uh, that he- trade was that uh, Fox being such a good prospect. Um, well, that's what lended the Flames yeah. to winning that trade in the long run. But even when we look at deadline deals and stuff like that, it's often the defensemen they get more than the forwards, unless you're you know a mm-hmm. really high end pinnacle guy. Um, sure. the next, and usually the next, those guys don't get traded. Exactly. Especially not young ones, right? I think the last time we saw the Flames take a D-man in the first round would have been the uh, Anderson year. No, because that wasn't even the first. They traded out well, of the first round. Uh, well, Anderson, and he was a second round. Yeah, That's right. Yeah, they traded out of the first yeah, round. Yeah, that's how we got Hamilton in the, in the first place. I think Tim yeah. Erickson was the last uh, first rounder D-man. Wow. So. Okay. so It's ma- been a yeah. bit. Yeah, and, and not, not the guy you want to follow is Tim Erickson. Uh, yeah, the next I think guy the is, one before that was Matt Pellick, so not not exactly a good list. No. So, no, it's not. No. Z's Bainham, uh, number 28 from the University of Denver. He's uh, from the U.S., a U.S.-born player, 18 years old, six foot, 183-pound left-shot defenseman. He's known as being a two-way guy. He's quite a playmaker. He's got good tactical knowledge. This is a guy who's rated as low as five or four by some people and as high as nine is the furthest I've seen him rated. Uh, This past year, he played for the University of Denver in the NCAA, 50 points, 42 games. I think not every defenseman can be, and I've watched this guy play a little bit, um, Ziz Bayum. He is... Definitely a two-way defenseman, but I think that you can't have all offensive D. I mean, look at what Tanev did for the Flames, right? Tanev was kind of the epitome of the defensive defenseman. I think this guy could turn into a player like that. What's your report, Matt? Well, yeah. Well, and I I think that, like, he is more of a good overall defenseman. Uh, His offensive game is elite, um, which is why he's I'd say that he's more of a playmaker Uh, guy, though, than your traditional offensive. yeah. And he's very much a more complete defender than uh, the other uh, guys that are in the top 10. But, you know, his offensive game is still right there, too. Yeah, for sure. But I, again, I think if you're looking at where he develops into, I think this guy's going to be your puck moving defenseman more than your, you know, your top offensive defenseman. And and that's a needed skill. But I just think that too often the fans today want that high yeah. scoring D-man, this is the guy that I think is going to be shooting from the blue line and from what I saw from him, but also that guy who knows how to keep the puck in the zone, how to, you know, move it to the forwards and get those assists. Yeah, more like a, a Mark Giordano type. Yeah, more versus, more your you quarterback know, like on the all on offense, the offense, like Evan play. Bouchard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and uh, both, both good names if you can develop into either one of those kind of guys, right? Definitely. Um, Another defenseman, if we if we go that way, and the last one we'll profile at the ninth uh, pick is Zane Perekf. I'm probably saying that wrong. Number 19 of the Saginaw Spirit. Uh, he's an 18-year-old from Noble Town, Ontario. He's a right shot. Um, 
six foot, 181 pounds. This guy is pretty much ranked where the Flames are going to be. I've seen him put about eight, nine, some as low as uh, 17, but I think this is right where the Flames could be. He played for Saginaw of the OHL, got 96 points in 66 games, 33 goals, 63 assists. That's quite impressive for a D-man. Um, and he's, he's again, a very offensive defenseman. What do you think of this guy? He is a very highly skilled offensive player, and he's more of the Evan Bouchard uh, style of, you know, all offense all the time. Um, I don't think his game is more well-rounded like Williams is, but, you know, it, it's also one of those where you can handle a guy if he's that good offensively to have a little bit of deficiencies where if you can get a good defense partner for him to, you know, give him the space to cook <laughs> and, you know, um, let him rip basically and uh, you know it, he would definitely be the number one offensive player for the blue line and i think that you know like you said his game is not as well rounded i think that's why this guy could easily fall to nine through you know 12 17 i think he's a very one diven- dimensional defenseman based on what i've seen and there are a couple other players that are in that general upper bracket um you know, um, there's the six foot seven Anton Slayev who's rated roughly in the top five. To me, when I've seen him play, he screams Tyler Myers, where he has some offensive game, he's got some defensive game, but he's also just six foot seven, and that's why he's rated there. If he was like six foot two, he'd probably be like 25th to 30th. Um, and like the hopes is that he develops into a Chara type guy, but I just don't see him becoming that caliber of player. Um, and th- there's a couple other defensemen, Sam Dickinson and Carter Yemchuk, uh, Yakumchuk, uh, who played with the Hitman, who are also in that same kind of category as, uh, Perrick and Buiam. They're just a little bit further down. Uh, from yeah, those two I, guys, but I'd rather take Booyam or Parrick over, over Yakim Chuck. Like, he's a good defenseman, but I think that there's some... There, the further you get past 10, the more you can start to point out flaws in guys' games. Yes, exactly. And it, it's one of those where, like, if the Flames are picking at 9 and, say, Ginla's gone and, like, the three that we heavily profiled are all gone you might start looking at possibly trading down a pick or two um, just to see, you know, what assets, if you're going to go for either Dickinson or Yakumchuk. Um, The other forwards that are available are in the decent, but don't scream like high, high end upside, Um, like more like second line forwards, uh, whether it's uh, Seneki, Iserman, uh, Be- Berkeley, Caton, um, Caden Lindstrom, he, I think he's up a little higher than he should just due to his size. Like they're just, there's not a lot of flash with as much as there should be for a, like a top ten pick with those guys. So uh, yeah, that's why like again the for the forwards is my number one guy and then it's like demon all the way <laughs> after that. Yeah. No, I think if you're going to do this, you've got to take a D man with the number seven or sorry, number nine pick. Um, you've got to take that D man and you've got to use that as, you know, a time to rebuild. And we have to remember this rebuild is not going to, you know, hinge on one draft. It's not like, Oh my gosh, we didn't get, you know, the star player. Now we're doomed. Like we have a nine pick, right? Nine has flaws to it. This is one year in a multi-year rebuild. So take the best guy you can. And as you said earlier, I think you've got to take the D man. Mm-hmm. Yep. And yeah, you know, thankfully this year, there just happens to be a lot of them. And thank, you know, thankfully like that is one of the areas that the flames are lacking. Um, like centers and D men basically are number one and number two uh, for the rebuild. And like it looking forward to next year like if the flames get a d-man this year you're probably gonna be like okay who's the best center at wherever they're picking next year but you know it it just depends on what's available on the field at the time 
Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I just, you know, I just want to remind fans that, that, you know, this is not going to be one year and, oh my gosh, we got, you know, Crosby, we're good for the rebuild. Like where the flames are picking, you're going to have a player that has some flaws, whether it's a defenseman, a forward, whatever. Nine is not going to get you, you know, the next McDavid. Nine is not going to get you the next Crosby. So we, we can't, well, even if it's TJ Ginla, TJ Ginla is not going to save this franchise single-handedly, right? He's one piece, and we have to remember no. that, that this is this is the start of a rebuild. Yeah, like realistically, like the Flames to be like say where the Panthers are now. Like you look at their team, they have six really good forwards, three really good defensemen, and a star goalie, as well as like the rest of their team. And you know, like currently the Flames have uh, you know Connor Zari, who might be a top six forward. And that's basically it for the prospects. Like everybody else has a ton of question marks of whether they'll get, you know, anywhere close to that. Or, you know, like Hanzig last year is not looking as of right now, like a future NHLer at this moment. He, you know, he did have struggle mightily, you know, he did have injuries, but he also struggled after getting better. So it it's one of those where, you know, like this team's going to need to get a high number of players to actually develop, and it's not just going to be one pick, one guy to exactly. save the and, franchise. And, not and even one when the pick Flames rebuilt nine. last time, no, and like even when the Flames rebuilt last time, like it took Gaudreau in 2011, Monahan in 2013, Kachuk in exactly. 2016, Bennett and you know, Anderson and Shillington in uh, 15 to, like, start getting some of the foundational pieces on the team to actually pull themselves out of it. And, you know, like, that's five years' worth of drafting just to be good for a while. And, you know, like, that's where, like, the Flames are in the 2010-2011 stage right now, and it's not going to be easy. Exactly. Yeah. No, I would... uh I would just caution people to remember that. So then the Flames have some time to sit and wait. This is the first time I can remember that they've had two picks in the first. I mean, how many years have we traded out of the first? But uh, two first-round picks. Well, and you have to go all the way to Monaghan's draft yeah, in 2013. That's it. We either have one or we trade down or we trade right out. So it's the first time that we'll have two picks in the first, usually as a Flames fan. I'm used to watching the first round, seeing our pick turn off and doing something else. But... Maybe they're doing this because they were. We'll be now be engaged for the whole broadcast of the first round because we pick at twenty eight, so way at the other end. And like any pick at the end of the first round, it could be a lot of guys. There's a whole bunch of guys in that twenty to thirty range. Matt, you had some yeah, here. You like want realistically? There's about forty guys that uh, could possibly be the the late first round pick, and this is where like you know going off the board. It happens quite frequently, um, and you know sometimes that's a successful thing to do. Sometimes it's not, um, but yeah, there are a number of guys. Uh, and once again, this le- leans a little more D heavy, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll start off with uh, Stian Solberg from Norway, a uh, defenseman. Um, He's been rated a little bit all over the place. He's 18. He's a defenseman like Matt said, 6'2", 201 pounds, left shot. I've seen him ranked everywhere from about 21 all the way to 44. He's uh, from Norway, like you said. He's played in the SHL this past year. Um, And actually, sorry, played in uh, Valangrina. He had 15 points in 42 games. A guy that you see ranked from... 21 all the way to 44. I always have some worries there about is this guy going to develop the way they they thought he would. You think he looks like Jerky Lume though, and that's pretty good pedigree to be compared to. Yeah, just uh, stylistically, his um, offensive instincts uh, and like how he plays. It, it, you know, like literally when I saw him, I'm like, oh, that looks like exactly like Jerky Lume. Um, which also I think dates us both because we know who that is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and he was a fairly good number three defenseman for a long time. And, 
uh, you know, a valuable member of both the Canucks and the Coyotes for a number of years. So uh, I think that uh, you can't go wrong with a good two-way defenseman like that type of player at number 28. But this is a guy who could also see fall to the Flames' second-round pick. If they, you know, True. depending on how much you like him, do you use the 28th pick on him? I don't know. And I haven't seen enough of him to know that. I don't know if he's that guy that you've got to have or if you would say, yeah, you know, if he falls, we'll take him. If not, oh, well. Um, yeah. the, next guy, the next guy on your list is Cole Bedouin, number 29 for the Barry Colts of the OHL. He's from Ontario. He's a centerman, 6'2", left shot. I've seen him ranked everywhere from about uh, 30 all the way to about 45. And he had a decent year for Barry. He had 62 points in 6-7 games. He also played on the Canada U18 team with TJ Ginla, got four points in seven games. This would be another forward for the Flames take, or I guess if they take Tiege another forward, if they take a defenseman A forward, what do you like about him? This is more of a, he plays center and he's big um, kind of pick. Um, his offensive skill is decent, uh, but, you know, it's more positional need than uh, flash with, when it comes to him. Um I, I don't see him being more than a third line center in the NHL, but you know, with his size being six two two ten, he has a decent overall makeup. I, I don't know. I'm not overly excited about uh, Bedouin myself. There's other guys um, in this list I'd rather take but, over him. Yeah, like to me, he feels like Tyler Benson with the Oilers, like where. There's some skill there and there's some size there, but the overall package seems to be lacking a bit. And, uh, you know, but positionally, he's the it right. It seems very much like a Keegan Kanzig type pick of take him because he's big. Yeah. And even 6'2 in the NHL and, isn't that or big. Or like Greg Nemitz. And it, no. Uh, yeah. It, it's one of those where it's like, K, okay, sure, I guess. It would not be a great pick, I don't think. But if, uh, yeah. if both guys are on the board, I'd rather take the next guy, uh, 17-year-old Emil Hemingway. He's from Finland. He's a six-foot-one right winger with a right shot. I've seen him ranked everywhere from 15 all the way down to about 37, I think was the lowest I've seen him. He played in the Finnish league uh, for uh, TPS of the Liga, got 11 points in 40 games, and also played for their, I guess, their U20 team. Uh, got 18 points in 13 games and had some playoff games there. This is a guy that, from what I've seen of him, looks like he's got a way better shot. Offense is definitely his thing. He can score from a distance. He's got a whole bunch of different shots. This, I think, is a much more dynamic player than Bedouin. Yes, and if he, he was a center, I think he might go a lot higher, but uh, his him being a right winger... Frankly, the Flames kind of need help everywhere, so yep. that's not a turnoff in any way, shape, or form. Um, he's got good size at 6'2", 200. There's not really anything to complain about. If that's who the Flames get, that would be a great pick. Yeah, I would be very happy with that at 28 if he's the guy that we get. Uh, the next player you wanted to profile was Nikita Artemonov, and he's another Russian player, 18, 5'11". 187 pounds. He's a left shot. He can play either wing, right wing or left wing. I think he played right wing for most of last year from what I was looking at. And in uh, this last season, he played 54 games in the KHL. So already playing men's hockey, if you will, um, in a top league. And in that league, he got 23 points in 54 games, which is pretty good. I've seen him rated anywhere from about 15th all the way down to 24th. So I think the Russian factor probably has something to do with that. Who do, this guy reminds you of a former flame. Who does he remind you of? Uh, Michael Frolik. And uh, also a little bit like Arturi Lekkonen with Colorado. Uh, just that really good offensively okay, but good defensively, good on the forecheck, pain in the butt to play against. Just the type of guy that you love on your team, but... He might not be a top six forward, but 
he would be a fan favorite on this team if the Flames got him. And if you're building a cup team, that's the kind of guy that you wouldn't mind getting at 28. I would love for a scout to tell him that. Well, we draft you because you're offensively okay. He's he yes. has the offense you would well, expect. Well, it's from not that his. Position. If he, yeah, like if he w- was more offensively gifted, he probably goes in the top ten. Yeah, it's just that his game is very much the higher energy in on the four check crash bang boom get the puck create havoc you know and while also being good on the penalty kill and he can put up some points you know and like if he became a 40 point guy on your third line yeah i was gonna say if he's a bottom sort of bottom pod or a bottom um player right sort of third fourth line you're not expecting 40 points you're not expecting you know i think 30 would be good out of him and at that point he doesn't need to be the high-end offensive guy no, and it, the way I look at the draft, um, like especially with where the Flames are at, getting guys who, like if you're building a cup team, would benefit you for that kind of goal. It, you know, that's where like Artemanov is higher on my list because he's that right kind of dirtbag <laughs> yeah. that you want in the trenches for your team. And, you know, that's why, why I like guys like Garnett Hathaway, Sam Bennett, you know, and Kachuk and like all of those type of guys. Because, you know, when the playoffs happen, they tend to be right in the middle of it. And we have to remember, and I think going in the draft, people always look at, you know, the star players. You've got to fill, you know, 12 forwards and 60 on any roster. So even if you draft a guy in the first who, you know, I look at a Glenn Cross type who can be on your roster for a long time and fill an important role. That's a successful pick in a lot of ways, unless you're spending your nine on that. Like if, yeah, if they can bring, you know, Artemanov in and uh, have him, you know, be a flame, a good third line flame for a number of years, that's a successful pick. You can't, not everybody can be, you know, your top three. No. And basically my view is with the top 15 pick, you should be aiming for like the first line winger, forward, center, D-man, goalie, whatever. But after that, it's about getting good players that will, yeah, you know, put you forward for in your you know building a team part, regardless exactly. of position or time. You know, whatever level they're at. Another player I really like who is on your list is Liam Greentree from the Windsor Spitfires, number sixty six. We won't make uh, Mario Lemieux uh, comparison just because of his number. He's from Oshawa. He's six foot two, hundred ninety eight pounds. He's a left shot, but plays right wing, so he plays that off wing. I've seen him rated as low as 15 and as high as 23, according to my notes here. Um, and actually, I think one rating even had him at six. We'll throw that out because that's such an anomaly. But he got 90 points in 64 games for the Spitfires. This is a guy who, from what I saw of clips of him, he navigates around opponents really well. He's got a good give and go. He's got really good hockey sense. I look at him to project more of a power forward type role. But what did you see from him? Uh, a lot of the same things as Bedouin, uh, where decent in all aspects, but the, the hockey IQ, I think is a lot higher with green tree and, um, the adaptability of making plays in close, um, and being able to out stick handle other players is a lot higher with green tree than Bedouin. Yeah. And that hockey IQ is what's going to lead you to a couple more points every year. Right, he's going to be able to navigate yeah. around players. And it, he's especially be able to get if that the puck Flames on the net more. Well, especially if the Flames are trending towards drafting for size and skill, getting a guy that's six two two twin um, as a right winger uh, definitely fits the bill more than like a five eleven guy. Um, yeah. So we'll see. Of all the forwards that we've talked about at the twenty eight position so far, Green Tree's the guy I'd probably go with. Mm-hmm. The next one's Sasha Boisver from the University of North Dakota. He's a Canadian player from Quebec. Um, six foot two, 171 pounds. He plays center. He's a left shot. I've seen him ranked as low as 16 and as high as 30 in different draft lists. Uh, again, playing in the NCAA or going to the NCAA this coming year, but he played for the Muskegon Lumberjacks of the USHL last year. 68 points in 61 games. 
to me, he's a hard guy to figure out what he's going to be. I don't know if he's going to be a more of a two-way player, a power forward. He's got a lot of tools where he, I think he could be molded in a lot of different ways. But what did you see? Well, he, uh, of the later round guys um, for the forwards, I thought he had the most flashy high-end skill out of all of them. But he is extremely inconsistent. And it's one of those where... If he was consistent, he probably would be in that top 10 range. Um, he has the size, certainly, at six foot two. Um, it's hard to tell. And, like, with the Flames having two first round picks and the guy being a center winger, um, it, it's one of those where you, if, if you think that you can hit a home run with him and turn him into the high end impact forward then it might be worth the gamble uh where the flames currently are in their situation i don't think that they're in a, a position to take gambles but um could be an interesting player uh if he does hit the mark but i, I think that the flames need a little bit more of a sure thing ish um than a uh, guy who might be an 8 or 9 out of 10 or a 2 out of 10 <laughs> at the next level. Yeah, I don't think they need someone who's inconsistent with a first round pick. If this is a guy who fell to the second round, maybe that's where you take that flyer, right? But Yeah, if with, he fell to the Flames second round pick, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but I think, you know, like you said, he's inconsistent and I still don't really know if you can teach consistency. Like, you know, that was a big problem we had I mean, we've seen that with a number of with players Rujitska. recently, with even Rujishka most most recently, um, you know, and it's frustrating. And I don't think you can rely in your rebuild using one of your top two picks on a guy who's inconsistent. So I think yeah. if, if it was me, I'd take him out of this list if I was a scouting staff and say, if he falls to the second round, great, he's ours. But otherwise, there's, I think, better guys to pick up because of that. If you if you want to go D again, EJ Emery a great option. He's from Surrey, BC. Uh, he's six foot three, hundred eighty five pound right shot D man. I've seen him ranked everywhere from seventeen to thirty five on different lists. One had him as low as forty three, um, and I think draft prospects hockey at fifty six. But we'll throw those two out. Uh, generally, he's expected to go in the late first. Uh, last season, he played for the U.S. national team. Uh, got 16 points in 61 games. He also played in the World Juniors, and he's committed to the University of North Dakota. So for those that don't know, these guys that are committed to the USHL, NHL teams actually get longer time on their rights. Instead of two years to sign them, you get four years. So there is some strategy in some ways to maybe taking a guy who you know is going to need more development time, and you can leave them to develop before you got to turn them pro. So especially in those later picks, I think there can be some strategy there. But... I've seen Emery play a little bit. I saw him play for the U.S. National Development Team on TV. I like this kid. What did you 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 think? You think he looks like another Flames team man? Yeah. The only drawback with him is that his offensive. Well, he's in the same mold as a um, Tanev type guy, where he is a very much a shutdown guy. He's six foot three. He's a good skater. The problem is, is that his offensive game is beyond terrible. <laughs> And, like, he is basically going to be a chip the puck up the ice to somebody else. <laughs> like, that's your job. <laughs> you you handle the puck type guy. Um, and I'll just go smash the guy in the corner <laughs> as he comes down. Um, he's not... And there's a place for that. Like, I still don't yeah. believe that every defenseman needs to have offensive upside. No, and it's one of those where, like, if the Flames decided to trade down with their first pick maybe into the late late or first or early second There's not much more um, later in the first but yeah well well you never know there's four more picks uh, after us so uh, you know if they say trade down to like 35 or 36 or something and were to get emory and like an additional second like that might be a viable option um i don't think i would want to use number 28 on him specifically or uh charlie ellick who's a very similarly profiled player but in the second round definitely would would not mind picking up those type of guys uh with the flames early second or if they were to trade down to yeah, get I mean, additional assets ellick's a canadian he's a whl player 
Um, we won't talk a lot about them because they're, like you said, they're kind of the same. Uh, six foot three defenseman. He's rated everywhere I've seen from about 27 all the way to 60. So, yeah, I would say Alec doesn't have as much upside. The only thing I like about, um, again, EJ Emery is you get those extra years in the NCAA, and that might help the development there, turn them pro a little bit later. But I agree, probably not the best way to go with number 28. Yeah, it, like it, to me, it'd be like how the Flames drafted Kuznetsov, where, you know, he's become a very good AHL defenseman, and he might eventually become an NHL defenseman in the like five six range, but you know, like I, I don't know as if there's the upside to go beyond maybe a f- four at the most yeah. with any of those type of and guys, which is fine. The, you can find that same upside later in the draft, though. Yeah, and like I would definitely be targeting bigger defensemen throughout the draft with subsequent picks and try to you know backlog the system with a bunch of good bigger sized players to see but you know you don't necessarily need to do that with 28 i agree um i a not as big defenseman who you profiled here aaron kivaharo he's an 18 year old defenseman five foot ten 185 pound left shot from finland he's projected to go anywhere between about 26 and 63 so again a huge variance there this kid is known as a breakout wizard he he's really good at giving false information to his opponents deking them out getting that breakout he plays i'd say a very careful calculated style like i mean this guy has some hockey sense to him that's going to take him further um, this, yeah. pa- this past year he played in the Liga um, and he got two two points in seven games. He also went to the World Championships um, and then played some uh, some games as well for Finland's international junior team. So what do you like about him, Matt? Well, it, to me, he basically reads as the same type of player as Oliver Shillington was. Like uh, He got hurt at, uh, and missed most of the season with a knee injury. Um, but at the start of the year was considered a potential top 10 pick and because of his immense offensive skill, uh, but his size and the injuries have dropped him and this might be a good pick either at, um, I think more so in the second round as well, but uh, a player that uh, is interesting and, has that higher end offensive upside, whether that materializes or if the knee injury derails him entirely, who knows? But, you know, just an interesting player. If they're both on the board, Emery or this guy? I go with Kiwi Harju. Okay. I would probably. And it's close, though. Um, It would depend on what our previous picks were. Yeah. Like if the Flames say they got Wiam or Perrick with number nine. Then I'd probably go with Emery over uh, Kiwi Harju just because. See, yeah, I, I'd probably go Emery just because I'm I'm a little worried about the knee injury factor. True, um, but that's me. I mean, there's no right or wrong. That's why I wanted to ask you. Like, you know, I think yeah. one of us is right or one of us is wrong. Some team yeah. will take both of them. Yeah, it to me, it's like a fifty-fifty. Could go either way on either of those guys. Like it, it just. Uh, because organizationally, like the Flames don't really have any offensive guys uh, that are in the junior level. Like the guy that they just got off of Vancouver, uh, Bruce Davich, is basically the only high end guy that they have currently. And I think he'll probably be turning pro as well. So probably not yeah. The, so like they the don't really ranks. have any other high end, flashy offensive guy. So that's where uh, you know I'm leaning a little bit more towards right at the moment. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, the next player you profile, the centerman, Dean Letourneau, who uh, is committed to St. Andrews College. He's a, an Ontario player from Braceout, Ontario. 6'7", he's a big boy, 209 pounds, right shot. Centerman, I've seen him ranked everywhere from about 30 to mid-40s. Um, I saw him ranked at 63 in one list, but that's a list that's had all sorts of weird guys in weird places. This past year, he played for St. Andrews College. Uh, 25 points in 14 games. The PHC, which is not a great league. I mean, that's not a league anyone's ever ever really heard of. That's not even the top Canadian league. And he's committed next year to a U.S. college. So, again, you'll get that NCAA extra time with this guy. Uh, he'll be going to Boston College. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to be making a dreaded comparison. 
Mark Jankowski, 2.0. <laughs> um, he's a six foot seven center uh, who absolutely dominated the league that he was in. He had a ridiculous amount of points. But he's also in a league that's like, uh, what? <laughs> you know, which league is that? I don't know. I've never <laughs> so, even heard of it until I started doing no, this research. Literally, same here. Uh, but the six foot seven center thing, like if he turned out, you know, you might get a guy in the same kind of caliber as a tag Thompson. Uh, but, you know, you're more likely going to get a Mark Jankowski type. This guy feels like the type of player you bring in for a walk on, not use a first round pick for. Yeah. It, if the it was available in the second round, it might be an interesting pick. But yeah, it it's hard with where the Flames were at uh, to gamble. It much like with Boyce Fair, uh, with gambling with him, you know, um, he could be a perfectly good player uh, just in a bad league, or you know, he's just dominating because he's huge, and it, it's hard to tell. Yeah, and I like. I wish he was already in the NCAA or even playing in top level Canadian college hockey because it's hard to, you know. I mean, it'd be like me saying, "Oh, Matt's the best in his beer league team," but let's put him onto real competition, see how he does. Maybe this guy goes to Boston College, which is a great hockey program. The fact he got into Boston College tells me there's something there, but I don't know. There's just too many variables to use the 28th pick on him, in my opinion. Yeah. If we had a year of NCAA to watch, I'd feel a lot more comfortable. Yeah, and it's one of those where he might be an interesting gamble with the second round pick, uh, but you know, it, just an interesting player uh, that stood out as being a little different from everybody else, just for that reason. I'd be disappointed if they took him at twenty eight. Yeah, I think I would be too. It's like trade down a bit for yeah, that like, if like, you need if you need that guy. Yeah, I mean, if this is the guy you think you need, there's better guys out there. And like you said, if you feel we have to have this guy, get some assets to do that because he'll still be available, I'd say, probably mid-second. Possibly. Um, or at least early second. But yeah, if you're going to trade this guy, trade down to get him because if you use 28 on him, I'm going to be disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> and the last guy we'll profile is Leo Solon Wallinas. Uh, he's a Swedish player, six foot, left shot defenseman. Uh, 183 pounds. I've seen him ranked everywhere from about 29 to 69. Um, most have him kind of in the early early 40s, late 30s, so probably more of a second-round guy. He played all over the place in Sweden this past year, including at the World Juniors, where he got three points. What do you like about this player? Uh, just a smart two-way defenseman. Uh, he's good at both ends of the ice and just solid overall. Um, this is more of a guy that I was kind of profiling for the second round pick but um would be an interesting addition um lots of skill there as a defenseman and like frankly i think that because this defense uh draft is more defense heavy period that you know why not you know go and get three or four d men with the various picks that we got in the upper end rounds um and millennius uh would be a good pickup if the flames were to get him so unlike with the with the earlier pick where we said if a certain guy's available, if Tej is available, you got to take him. I think this one's wide open. If you are sent to the podium, if Craig Conroy says, Matt, you're going to the podium to make this pick for us, who are you picking? Um, if everybody's available, say, um, the player I'm taking is Artemanov. Okay. That's- Just because of the feisty um, crash and bang style, I think the Flames could use that. If not him, then it would be probably Green Tree, and then you know you're starting to get down into the weeds. Yeah, I was gonna say for me it'd be probably Green Tree first, Artemanov second. I think either of those you could do. I think the Flames. I think if they're gonna take a D man, you take the D man early. Like you know, like you said, I think Aginla, if he's there, they have to take him. But otherwise, if not, I think they take a D man at nine. I think that the D man that we profiled here, you could still get in the second. But I do think. The Flames will need, or a similar guy in the second, but I think the Flames will need to take more defensemen in this draft than they traditionally have. Yeah, I think that, especially with it being such a uh, D-heavy draft, that they should walk out with three or four in the top four rounds. Like, they need to 
basically stack D picks. Yeah, and I mean, we talked about it. They pretty much got two picks in each of the top four rounds. Like, even if you use half of those on D-man, take one D-man around, you're in good shape. Yeah, and especially with the quality of guys this year, uh, might as well load up. Like, even if the Flames ended up picking five or six of them, I wouldn't be opposed. Like, it, it would be a little bit much at that point, but frankly, because of the Flames overall system kind of lacking um it, especially in defensemen um and centers um that th- those to me are like the two highest priority and then uh yeah you know, I, th- I think even there. with the the late picks like the seventh pick just take a d-man or a goalie like you know d-man or goalie with some of those later picks you just need to i think bring d-man in even if they don't make the nhl they're, I mean, part of the reason the Wranglers, I think, didn't go as far this year is they didn't have the D-men. Like, this whole organization just needs professional defensemen. No, and, like, getting a couple of the guys at the deadline helped. Um, but, you know, it, it's like, okay, now you have a couple of guys that are okay. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, but they're you all, you know, early to mid-20s, you know, even, you know, I think one of them in their 30s. Like, you know, they're, they're good for now, but they're not going to be who you base this well, organization on. I'm, I'm meaning, like, guys like uh, Grishnikov and Bruce Davich and... Oh, yeah, okay. I thought you meant some of and uh, Kuz, uh, Kuznetsov. Like, they do have some guys available. It's just, you need more. Mm-hmm. And yeah, because if you pull one of those guys up, you need someone to fill their spot, right? Yeah, and, like, currently we, we have nothing, really. Yeah. Um, coming up the pipes right at the moment so we need to start loading up and you know it uh, frankly because of where the flames are at um i always tend to like look at like when you're starting a rebuild that it makes more sense to go d heavy to start with because they take longer to develop so that way you know because how would you say like forwards are kind of easy to plug and play like it you know like the flames when they drafted monahan like he was right there kachuk was right there bennett was right there um like when you're picking in the top five ten you know like it's very much easier to plug and play those guys um where d-men regardless need like two three four years to be able to play at the nhl level and then even then more time after that so that's partly why i think the flames should lend a lot more heavy to the d-men aspect right now uh just to get the ball rolling on that aspect because like say next year if the flames are picking in the top five ish which is roughly where they should you know like you're gonna be getting somebody that you can plug into the lineup right away pretty much and you know it, it's a lot easier to throw oh this guy's a first line player <laughs> you know in where i agree with you. you know other guys need a lot more time to figure out how to be an nhl player we're running a little bit long here so i have a couple questions for you we will rapid fire these we will uh have more discussion on these in our next show but um, a lot of Flames fans have heard, I think, unfairly saying the Flames shouldn't take Americans because Americans don't want to be here. And yeah, we've had a couple Americans leave, but we have enough Americans that are here. Any worry about the Flames taking an American player? No, uh, I think success breeds things. And like, if it wasn't for COVID, frankly, I think Kachuk and uh, Gaudreau are still here. And, you know, like the whole situation didn't happen. <laughs> Yeah, but, and, I, uh, and I think even Fox, who we talked about earlier, was not because he was American. It was that was kind of a one-off. There's always a guy yeah, in every he, organization. He really, yeah, he really wanted. It's like um, Hyman with. Uh, um, he was originally drafted by the Panthers, but he only wanted to play for Toronto, and he basically said, "Well, I'm not going to sign with you, and I'm just going to sign with Toronto." And they ended up trading him for a fourth-round pick uh, to the Leafs, and he stayed there until he was a free agent. And, you know, like there are guys that are just like that where I want to play here mm-hmm. only and too bad. And what about Russians? Any worry there? No, no. Me neither. Uh, uh, neither. It, to me, it's who's good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I think a team that has opportunity, anybody wants to go to. And the Flames will definitely have a lot of opportunity in a couple of years. Well, and, you know, any of the prospects, you just look at the Flames prospect pool, like, 
you're pretty much going to be near the near or at the top when you get drafted because there's not a ton of guys to, that you're going to be competing with at the moment. So well, that's it. And the guys you are will probably have turned pro in the next two or three years. So then you're going to be the next up, you know, on the on the Wranglers and getting first time minutes there and that sort of thing. Yep. Um, likelihood of trading into the top eight. Do you see that? Flames I don't. Right, I don't really. Right now are nine and twenty eight. So do you think they'll trade into that top eight? I don't see a talent gulf um, that would warrant trading up. And no, as much as I want a Ginla, it, like if he went to five to Montreal, like the amount of assets that you'd have to give up to move up to get him, it's like. It, it would be different if the there was a talent gulf after like say pick six. Yeah. But like from two to about twelve, it's you're pretty much good. So And like you said, it would be fun to have a Ginla, but it's not worth moving an asset to make sure it happens. No. And like if he fell in our lap, awesome, take him instantly. Yeah. But you know, it, if you end up getting one of the good defensemen instead, oh no, yeah. we got a guy that profiles to be a top pairing defenseman. Oh, that's awful. You know, like, okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've heard, I've heard, let's just use this as a quick scenario. I've heard again, the link to Montreal at five. I'm not willing to give an asset to move from eight to five to make sure we get him. No. The, and certainly like it would probably take our 28th pick and something to move up the four spots just to get again. It's not worth it to no. us. I agree. It would suck. Because I would really like a Ginla, but yeah, like it, it does not make any sense. No, I think if if you're willing to go big and make that trade, and this isn't going to happen, but you're making a trade to go to first to get Celebrini, and the Flames don't have those assets, but like if you're that focused on making a trade, like you said, the talent gulf is after Celebrini. Yeah, well, and yeah, like there's no real difference between second third fourth fifth no. sixth seventh like it, there is slightly but not 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 by enough i agree with you i i can't see them moving that pick to move up what about trading down with either pick um it would depend on who the top eight picks were like if again was on the board obviously no but like say he's gone and say william and Perrick are both on the board and you know that Team 11, say, wants a different, like, say, wants Iserman instead and is wanting to trade up for that. Sure. But I, I wouldn't bother myself. But you, you, you play the field. You, you know, like, you know what everybody else is doing. So, uh, especially, like, in the pick before and after. So, because they're going to be contacting you to see, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It, just to get but because it, you know. of that talent gulf, I can't see there being a lot of teams wanting to move up by one or two. Like, I think you're happy with whoever you get there. I can't see the Flames moving up or down with the tw- with the ninth pick. I can see with the 28th. Yeah. I I would be somewhat surprised if the Flames just picked at 28. I, I would be... Like, that seems like perfect opportunity because there's a number of guys that are available in the 28 to 35 range that are basically the same guy that if you can add like another second round pick at say 45 or something like that, like to me, that makes more sense to go with that approach. And we'll have this Um, discussion on draft day, the two of us instead of today, but I can also see, I think that there's a very real possibility the flames could trade for another first. So maybe you're, you're drafting say ninth, 10th, and then you move the 28th. That's possible too. So I think that one's a lot harder to determine because it's going to depend on what happens leading up to that. But yeah, I can't see them moving the ninth pick to move up, um, but I could see them acquiring another pick. Yeah. Well, and especially like, I I think that the flames pretty much know that they're basically open for business on all fronts. So, and like if there are certain players that teams want and the draft capital makes sense, then sure. And, and like you were saying with 28, I could see them not trading it down, but trading it out. Like, you know, if you can move, say, the 28 for Zegris or something like that, sure, do that. Um, you've got enough picks still. But, yeah, I I, I don't see them, I don't know, I, I don't see them picking a 28, whatever that means. Yeah. 
Well, and, and especially with the Flames basically being the only cap team that has cap space, um, you know, like the Flames could add like a 26th pick or a 25th pick in order to take deadbeat contract here as well. Because, um, you know, teams are wanting to prep for um, July 1st. And, you know, like Let's the Flames are... Let's come back to this discussion on draft day, Matt. Oh, I know. I'm just teasing ahead you know to talk you know give us things to talk about when we're doing our live next time on fireside chat (laughs) we near buddy beasley here well let's tell everyone what's going on on draft day we're excited for this it's going to be in our 12 years doing the show the first time we've done a live show with fan interaction um we've as you know partnered with bow river brewing this year and we're partnering with them again on June 28th, during the first round of the NHL draft, we will be down there. It starts at 5 p.m. Matt and I are going to be doing a live show. You can come on down to Bow River Brewing. We're going to have an open mic right next to us. So if you want to come and chat with us, give us your feedback. We'll be taking fan interaction. We'll be broadcasting the whole time. Of course, the guys down at Bow River or the whole team there, they're going to they're gonna have some great deals. They have a new non-alcoholic beer option. If you're not a beer guy, just come down for their pizza. You and I think their pizza is really good. You and I have been surprised by how good their pizza is. Yeah. Like it, it's really dynamite. I'm actually surprised for a brewery, how good their pizza yeah, is. Um, last time one of our listeners bought a couple of their pies to take home. Cause he liked them so much. So they got great food, great drinks, whether you want alcoholic, non-alcoholic, but come on, hang out with us again, a 5 PM start time until Whenever the first round's over, Matt and I'll be there. We'll be broadcasting live the whole time. We'll have some links. Yeah, if you want to give thoughts on uh, any trades that happen, whether Gimla gets dra- drafted by the Flames or, you know, any of those kind of things. It's your be chance a busy to day. be our co-host. Yes. <laughs> So It'll be a busy day. <laughs> drop in. If you can't make it right at five because of work or whatever, again, the Flames draft ninth, so you don't need to be there right it probably away. Won't, yeah, we probably won't be selecting till nearly six anyway, just because that's how the draft goes. <laughs> yeah, but drop by. Um, we'd love to see you. Hang out for as long as you want. Come by. Have some pizza, have some beer, hang out with us. Uh, it'll be a good time. We've always had a good time in our last events there, and we would encourage anyone to drop by. Like you said, hang out, listen to what everyone else is saying. We'll have a broadcast throughout the brewery. Um, we'll also have a link on our website if you're not going to be there or you want to eat your own pizza at home from you know that local place, Domino's. Um, you know, if you want to sit home <laughs> and watch, listen, whatever, you'll be able to listen to us online as well. But come on out. We'd love to meet everybody. We'd love to have you have your say. Um, we, we'd love to just hang out and and watch the draft with you. So more information will be available by the time you listen to this on firesidechat.ca. It'll be in the main navigation. And it'll be uh, called Live Draft Show. So check that out. We hope you can make it. Yep, Matt, and it'll be a fun time for the Flames and Matt, I'm for looking, us. I'm looking forward to seeing you on the 28th. Um, it'll be great. It'll be fun to do this. You and I have talked about a live show for a while, and I'm glad our friends at Bow River are willing to partner with us for this. Yeah, and then, hey, we might actually by then have actual running water. <laughs> we'll see. If not, preserve water, drink beer instead. Exactly. If it comes in the can, it's all good. That's right. <laughs> you don't have to worry about the taps. That's right. We're, we're doing our part here, right? We're trying to get you to drink beer, not water. So, Matt, we will see you on the 28th. And as always, go Flames, go. And go Panthers. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.